Hello everyone, welcome to another study vlog on Adorno's and introduction to dialectics. In lecture 3, Adorno explains how dialectical thought relates both to the parts and the whole. The whole changes in accordance with its individual parts, but it is not merely the sum of its individual parts. Oh, this is the most precarious camera setup ever. Truth must reveal itself from the matter. Apparently it's the matter which drives this morphing of everything and us not being determinate about anything. It's the matter, not the concepts, for some reason. By surrendering to the matter, dialectical thought can evolve the concept accordingly. Oh, I get it. A movement of the concept is drawn from the matter itself and not something subsequently imposed upon the latter by ourselves. I get it. It's necessary. It's necessary. Necessary, sorry. Because it's not our minds that are imposing it on the matter. It's the matter that is dictating it in our minds. If one does not surrender or focus on matter, the concept risks becoming reified, whilst the matter changes continuously. The movement of concepts. Concepts must not be explored in isolation, but comprehended in relation to their context. That might be social, historical, and so on. If we fail to uphold our concepts unchanged, if we insist that their being is a becoming, that truth itself is actually dynamic, then this amounts to a universal relativism that makes it impossible for us to say anything determinant about anything at all. Fair enough. Hegel's mediation explains how concept changes from part to whole. All animals does not mean zoology, but indeed zoology makes up part of all animals. I have a feeling that Heathcliff, the wild cat who likes to visit, might be here, so I'm going to go downstairs and feed him, and then I'll be back. You can go, you're coming with me. <laughs> oh. You want this though, don't you? Mm. Oh, it's fine now. Okay, so now I'm on lecture four. And I have learnt about... I just thought I'd explain why I used the word dialectic instead of the word thing in this diagram between thing and concept, because I was thinking I would dialectically conceptualise the dialectic as the thing in question. I don't know why I decided to do it like this. I just did. So initially when I said this was like a hermeneutic framework where the concept and the, the thing that you're thinking about changes in a hermeneutic iterative cycle, these, so here you have, hmm, I think, uh, we'll do something different. He uses the notion of the I and the non-I. So I would be the starting thing the positive, whatever, and then non-I would be the opposite of this, the contradiction, so you are not you. Now this arises from this by nature, it has to, it's not a separate thing, it's not an arbitrary random addition, it's not a, just a, it's not a random opposite, it is an opposite that arises from this initial notion, I and non-I. Now what you can do is, this is called a negation, so you've negated the initial thing. Now. You can negate the negation, this is the negation, you can negate this again, this would take you back to the initial thing, but it would not be the initial notion before you negated it, it would be uh, the I with the addition of negation. So it's you've gone to the non-I and then you've gone back to this and this would carry into this, so now it's called the negation of the negation. Because this is a negation and you've negated it back to itself, right? So this is now imbued with the non-I, the I and non-I, and you can on and on like this ad infinitum. In lecture four, we learn that truth is a result of a bunch of contradictions or negations and so on, but not as a result at the end, rather the result is this unsystematic melange of contradictions. Adorno took us deeper into the mechanics of this by explaining just how the movement of the concept moves such that it can go beyond these contradictions. 
first there is a starting principle, then there is an opposition to this starting principle that arises out of that principle. It is not an external opposition brought into the system. The opposition must always be derived imminently from the initial claim or proposition itself. Adorno gives the example of I and non-I, or the idea of a free and just society compared with the reality of society. Now, the opposition that arises from the initial claim or proposition and the initial proposition find imminent critique in the face of each other. And this contradictory nature of negation followed by negation of negation and so on is what the result is. The synthesis is a simultaneous clash of antithesis and thesis, but it is not a mere result. Continuous negation develops the principal thesis and surely the antithesis. Truth arises from these contradictions, and as such, the truth is not given. We do not have the whole at our disposal, because we can't transcend the limitations of our thought. Because truth is dependent on the dialectic between concept and matter, it is a dynamic event fixed to its time. It cannot be an abstract fixed idea. It is constantly changing in accordance with the matter, and the matter is fixed to a time and a place. So basically he's saying that when you comprehend a thing, make sure to take into consideration its context, because time exists and we're constantly moving and constantly becoming. There is no universal truth. Truth itself only ever emerges from the concrete situation. The continual interaction between concept and matter can be seen as a continual interaction between theory and praxis. This does not spring forth at the end, but occurs continually. The unity of theory and practice is this interaction, not the result of it. Uh, I've also read somewhere that apparently Adorno explains this simpler than anyone ever could. It's just that the concept's difficult, not the way he explains it. I don't know, he uses a lot of clauses. Truth is a move towards the particular. Just as zoology tells us little about what zoology entails, the movement of thought is a move towards the concrete or particular. I like this next bit. He says that, um, basically, so there's this imminent critique between concept and thing, all the I and the non-I, all the contradictions arise from the thing itself, they're not something that's imposed upon the thing from outside. But he says that in order to start this process of, um, I don't know, the, the imminent critique between concept and thing, or the I and the non-I, or, you know, the thing and it's contradicting, in order to start it in the first place, you have to just have a starting point, which, I don't know, I guess you start with the I, and then you have the non-I, but because it keeps going on and on and on, in an imminent critique, immanent critique, you end up cancelling out the starting point. The beginning of a dialectic has to happen in order to start understanding the dialectic, but it doesn't become the dialectic. It changes in a dialectical process, and so annihilates itself. This start is abstract, isolated from anything else, and so regarded as false. Nevertheless, it is needed in order to start the dialectical process of comprehension. It's like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Pick a starting point, the chicken lays an egg, the egg then grows up to be a chicken. You need a starting point, and he says, well, we just got our starting point, but once the starting point is established, it cancels itself out, and then the starting point is no more. He's saying, well, here, we've got to start somewhere, <laughs> but it cancels itself out in the end. It helps because talking about this is difficult <laughs> and when I try discussing this with people who are also reading it, you get a lot of people going, mm, you can't say that, it doesn't exist as concept and thing is separate from each other. And Madonna's like, just accept that you need to start somewhere. It just cancels itself out the more you go around it. I guess it's like the start of any paradox. Ah, you know like time travel films? You know, where they go back in time and then that was actually the reason for the initial going back in time moment. There's a paradox, basically. The start of any paradox, in order to comprehend it, you've got to start somewhere. I think that's like the basis of hermeneutic frameworks as well, where you keep learning the same thing over and over again and then your knowledge of it grows. But the starting point of it is just not determinate, really, if you were to think about it. You know. <laughs>